Hello, welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. I'm joined as pretty much always by... Yeah, I'm, I'm Ka- always here. Catherine Rubino, yeah. also of Above the Law. How are you? I'm, I'm okay. How about you? You know, all right. Uh, things are getting a little bit warmer. Um, yeah, I was going to so, say, the yeah. sun is shining. It's it's definitely spring at this point. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's good to know. And importantly... Now, in New York State, at least, everybody who's 16 or older is now eligible to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Oh, there you Yay! go. Yeah. No, See, that um, was really, I was trying to cue you up. For, oh, well, that's a, yeah, that's ready? a good We're, point. Yeah. Everyone is now eligible to be vaccinated. Yeah. There we go. There we go. I mean, yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of a hard time switching windows over to that, but I hear. Oh, well, um, I mean... Yeah. Okay. We you can justify it any way you want, but <laughs> yeah. No, I'm really excited that the vaccine has uh, kind of taken off. I even wrote an article on Above the Law that is goes kind of beyond our normal fare uh, because it's not really legal specific. But now that everybody and all the lawyers and everybody else out there can get a vaccine, um, the system for getting an appointment is not the most straightforward one that exists. So ah. some friends and I had been cobbling together the the kind of how-to guide, and I actually turned it into an above-the-law post. Interesting. Well, let's talk about that in a second, because it seems like yeah. it, what, what you did is you went through like all the bureaucracy and stuff mm-hmm. that has to be done to get it done and came up with an answer. If any of you out there are looking to streamline administrative tasks, you should hear from our friends at Lexicon. Here's a message just for the attorneys out there. So you passed the bar, joined a firm, or even built your own. Now are you finding out that you're doing more administration than actual law practice? Lexicon can help. Lexicon is a legal services and technology provider with over a decade of experience streamlining administrative tasks like timekeeping, HR, billing, client intake, and more. So you can focus on maximizing billable hours and increasing client satisfaction. Call 855-4-LEXICON or visit lexiconservices.com slash go to learn more. I see what you did there. Yeah, no, I so, thought it was pretty slick. It All was right, so slick. so what you and your friends did, uh, and mm-hmm. from what I understand, you did this at least from having read the post and all. You did this very early on, like when the first vaccines yeah. started getting released. You went through and created a comprehensive guide for yeah, how. So what New York, happened was yeah. uh, when sixty five and older, I think it was January eleventh in New York State, mm-hmm. uh, when sixty five and older folks were eligible to make appointments. Uh, about halfway through that day, I got a phone call from my mom, and she was distraught. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think is a, a conservative way of putting it um, because she she thought she had an appointment, but she lost it because it, you know, it just disappeared. And oh, no, is she terrible? At, and she was, you know, a little self-conscious about technology because, you know, obviously it's not the thing she grew up with because she's over 65, and which is why she was eligible. But, you know, so she, there was a lot of stuff going on and, and she was very upset. And so I was like, there has to be an easier way. So I kind of got in early. Other friends of mine or teachers were eligible early. Other friends and myself were eligible because of pre-existing conditions. So sort of as each group has slowly uh, been added to the eligible folks, more and more people were able to kind of help inadvertently contribute to this. You know, I would share, we'd share kind of the document, the working document we had with anybody who needed it. And um, as they got, oh, this didn't work, but this part did. And, mm-hmm. and the truth of it is that there's a couple of aggregator sites that you can follow. And they'll give you the information. Oh, there have been 200 appointments released at this site. There's this available here. Mm-hmm. And then you have to go through. And, and the problem is that there are overlapping systems. Right. It, it, it's it's basically federalism at its worst, but yes. within one state. Because uh, there's state distribution sites, city mm-hmm. ones, private people having mm-hmm. some. They all have different requirements. Yep. They have different setups. Uh, so yep. it, it was very difficult. Now, I, I, you know, full disclosure, I was a beneficiary of your, uh, <laughs> your early draft draft of this. Uh, And indeed, I I mean, not to uh, give you too many accolades here, but (laughs) your document helped me get an appointment. Mm -hmm. And then I forwarded it to some friends of mine. And just the other day, when one of them became eligible, he said, well, now I got to try and find an appointment. And without any prompting from me, other friends of mine stepped in (laughs) and said, have you looked at the thing Catherine put together? Uh, So it was a good guide. And I think it was important that you turn this into an above law post. Obviously, You it's can't a, answer how good. you can't answer how the whole country goes, but because we're in 
we're in the business of the legal industry. We, mm-hmm. you know, are headquartered in New York City, and right. that is where a lot of our readers are headquartered. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't help you out necessarily if you're the DC or West Coast crew, right, but right. Uh, we can, we can, you know, hopefully you can build on it. And, and this create is what I'll say. Similar. Well, a couple of the the resources are nationwide. Uh, Vaccine Spotter actually scans all of the pharmacy um, websites and kind of puts all those in one place. So there are some things that overlap, but there are also super specific ones. There's a text number I put in the post that only gives you information about Staten Island vaccines. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, full disclosure where my family is from. My mother, yeah, yeah. you know, still lives there. So uh, that's how I came upon that information. But I got a text to two because I, I signed up for the text alerts, even though I no longer need them, just kind of sample it before I put it in the post. I get text at two o'clock in the morning being like, there are 200 Johnson & Johnson appointments that have been released at the following site. Wow. But, you know, for people who can't check constantly, depending on your job, you know, and and lawyers are somewhat fortunate in the sense that you're in front of a computer all the time. So being having another window open maybe that has the website that you can kind of check to see what's currently available is something that's feasible. But teachers are not in front of computers all the mm-hmm. time. Nurses, well, they probably are, are taken care of already because they're healthcare professionals. But, you know, there are professions, there are plenty of professions of folks who are not in front of their computer all the time. So having an option of getting information texted directly to you is is a benefit. Yeah. So there's that option. And the other thing I kind of want to, well, there are two things actually I want to say. The first is it's an incredibly frustrating prospect. And mm-hmm. that is true in New York. And I think New York's done a fine enough job comparatively of it. I've heard way worse stories in other states, but whether you're New York, New Jersey, California, whatever, it is a frustrating process. You will inevitably think that you have an appointment and lose it at the last second, as my mom did kind of on day one that yeah. got this whole thing started. That is not unusual. You can't be too upset about it, even though it is very upsetting. But if you kind of dedicate the time, eventually an appointment will come. So that's first. And the second point is, because there are these overlapping systems, often they don't really check against one another. Yeah. So you can have a state appointment booked and also find one. Maybe it's a more convenient location, an earlier time, you know, something like that in the city system, but you still have your state appointment. That's fine. You know, try to find the best appointment for you, but cancel it as soon as possible. Right. So that somebody else can get in there. As soon as you cancel them, they go back into the system. It's just back to the pure inefficiency of a system that runs on kind of this modified federalism. Right. And if there was a unified system, you could say, you know, keep my appointment, but look for additional things earlier. And, and, you know, you could cancel and book a new one at the same time, theoretically, but that's not the way the system currently works. I think it is if you're trying to modify like a city appointment and that sort of stuff. But there's city, there's uh, health and hospital, New York City health and hospital. There are the pharmacy sites, as I've said. There's a lot of different ways you can get vaccine appointments, which is great and useful, but you know, don't be a jerk. Don't hog multiple appointments. Make sure that you're putting them back into the pool so that they're not wasted doses. Because it's two things. Not only are you taking up an appointment slot that somebody else wants, but if you're not releasing it in enough time for somebody else to book a new one, those are potentially wasted doses. Mm-hmm. Because we know that, you know, at the end of the day, that's a potential problem with the way the, the vaccines currently are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, it strikes me like I I, I'm not a public health in, uh, professional, but it struck me early on that I understood first responders and so on. And mm-hmm. I, you know, you feel for the folks who are have worse conditions, but I almost felt like the right answer was to just open it up and get as many people as possible, no matter who they were, just because herd immunity is a thing. And it sure. would have increased the likelihood that people weren't hogging appointments and so on if you if you just were churning out everybody at once but I, who knows I, I mean i don't know I, I think that there's a counter to that too yeah. which is that it may have made it worse right that people if you kind of open up the floodgates all at once there is a and there's not as much vaccine then as there yeah. is now right so there's a scarcity issue that is only compounded by saying everybody could have it so yeah. there's more of a like i mean listen we've made the analogy in the piece and in in personal conversations all the time to hunger games and i think that really only would have fueled it. And I think that, you know, if you can't get an appointment and you've been trying for a month, I think that's a terrible place to be in. If you're not eligible for that month, I think that it makes it feel like the system is still working the way it's intended to. And we did just didn't have as many doses in in March as we do now. That that, that is fair. I, it just, 
obviously the hurdles that people are going through to try and find things, yeah. uh, it, largely because there's overlapping and different. Mm -hmm. it, it also would be easier if they were the same uh, restrictions in every place, but the state has different ones than the CVSs do that have different ones. Right. Than, yeah, and and which, they're they're becoming more streamlined as we get further into the process. But I mean, I know, know the state one is getting more and more liberal here in New York as more and more reasons for Cuomo to do things that will distract <laughs> from every other problem he has. I mean, sure. he. I mean, there are, but, there he, but he's reasons, running out. He's reasons. legalized pot and he's <laughs> he's opened up all the vaccines. I don't know what what he's got yeah. up his sleeve next, but Not, well, we'll see. <laughs> I guess I guess we'll all live. Through it. But yes, in the beginning, pharmacies could only uh, vaccinate 65 and older. Now it's down to 30 and older uh, and pre-existing conditions. So that's that's a so it's about it's where the share. state was a while ago. Uh, yeah. yeah, last week. The yeah. Last as of and last I, week. I think within a week or so that they're expected to lower it down to 16 as well. Um, I haven't heard definitively whether or not they have been able to yet, but I think that that will kind of become increasingly broad. Okay. Well, here, this is going to be one that you aren't expecting okay. uh, because we're going to change things up a little okay. bit. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Noda powered by M&T Bank. <laughs> you went to law school to be a lawyer, not an accountant. Take advantage of Noda, a no-cost IOLTA management tool that helps solo and small law firms track client funds down to the penny. Enjoy peace of mind with one-click reconciliation, automated transaction alerts, and real-time bank data. Visit trustnoda.com slash legal to learn more. Terms and conditions may apply. So speaking mm -hmm. of law school, yeah, uh, see, the transition's coming on the back end instead of the front end. See, you didn't see that coming. I did not. Yeah. So talking about law school for a second, we have uh, U.S. news rankings. Oh, we do. Yeah, yeah. that's true. We had previewed what we thought they were going to be, but now we actually do have them. And mm -hmm. I think the big story, I mean, there are a lot of stories to unpack from within this, but I think the biggest one is um, poor Georgetown. Yeah. <sighs> Well, this is not the first time they've fallen out of the T14. Right. So the T14, and you and I uh, agree on this. We, uh, The rest of Above the Law's staff has historically not. But you and I agree that T14 is kind of a dumb ranking, right? Sure. Well, just just because it's not... T14, uh, the top 14 law schools are given a special place because it's been historically the same 14 law Correct, schools over right. and over again with, you know, now two exceptions of years where that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. However, we don't treat it as, hey, these folks have been consistent. We treat it as though there's a drop-off after 14 to 15, which is not probably true. The, right, the gap right. between the 13th school and the 15th is probably non-existent, but because it's been the same one for a while, we act like it is. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, yes, I definitely think that's true. But the other part of that is that all prestige is made up, right? Like, they're, they, they, I mean, sure. that, that's true, though, right? Like, uh, I don't think that Columbia is significantly worse than, you know, or, 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 right, or Harvard, or that it's significantly better than Penn or NYU, whatever. NYU, okay. though it is. No, that's you know. that's interesting that you went there because well, I, I could to. see that I coming, to, yeah. and you didn't really you didn't really stick the landing as well as uh, as as I would have. But that's just my my skills from having learned advocacy yeah. at your, your NYU T6, that I'm yeah. better at it. Yeah, T six education yeah. as opposed yeah. to four. No, yeah. yeah, I hear what you're saying. Uh, that's cute. <laughs> But yeah, no, there are obviously gaps and tiers right. uh, that exist. I think uh, like we all talk about the YHS CCN thing, mm -hmm. that there's a gap between the Yale, Harvard, Stanford and the Columbia, Chicago, NYU, and then everybody else. But the 14 number became magic just because it was the same right. people over and over, right. not because there's a demonstrable drop off from 14 to 15. So hopefully... We thought this would, might be true the last time when I believe it was Texas who knocked uh, Georgetown mm -hmm. out a few years ago, and then Georgetown reclaimed the 14 spot, and we went back to just saying T14 all, of, all over the place. Maybe UCLA, which now has taken that spot from Georgetown, maybe this will be the impetus that we get over the idea that 14 is a magic number, because as soon as it's not the same people forever and that consistency point... It doesn't really mark a marker. I think. I think. I think the opposite will be true. I think that it just further solidifies the T fourteen because mm. I think that now the story is, at least colloquially, that oh gosh, UCLA has made it to that threshold. UCLA yeah. has put itself in the elite tier. And even though I think it started because of the consistency of the first fourteen schools, there has become this sort of perception that there is a demarcation there, and whether or not it's real. I don't think your quality of legal education changes as much in any of the schools in the top 
25, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah well, right. I think right? the top 25 is a much more accurate. Right. It, it, but but the point is, there's there's still a, you know, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, CC, and, you know, there's still these, yeah. these kind still of barking. layers. Yeah. There's still these, these layers to it. I think that creating lists is a human function and something that lawyers and the legal profession in particular really gravitates towards that kind of organizational structure. And I think that even though it was created simply because of the consistency of the top 14 law schools, I think that it has default become a level, a distinction. And now now UCLA gets to count itself in that group. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, depending on what happens next year and the year after and, and so on and so forth, we'll see, you know, how consistent this becomes. But I think it, it kind of further solidifies that there's some line there because it matters to folks that Georgetown is out and UCLA is in. That means that there is a line. Yeah, I, right. I, I mean, there there is a line, but I just don't think it. My stance has always been, and historically, yours have been. No, you have I been with I me, and you're I don't like disagree devil's with advocate you. I don't, right well, now. Well, a little bit, but also I do think that uh, the fact that it ha- it has changed um, further kind of creates that people people care about that line yeah. in a way that they care about. Oh, I went to Harvard versus Cornell. Right. No, I, I agree. I just I don't know. I I just I'm hopeful that we get to a world in which the top. 20 or top 25 get respected because I think that mm-hmm. I think the gap between 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is basically non existent. Sure. And I think we have a arbitrary line at 14 just yeah. because those folks were consistent. Yeah, I, I do. Th- I, th- I think you're right about that. I don't see a difference yeah. between Vanderbilt and UCLA, for instance. Right. It, like they, right. they're both perfectly fine, they've set you up basically the same. You uh, can still get whatever job you want. Yeah. yeah. It, meanwhile, you know, the gap between Vanderbilt and somebody in the late 20s and right. high 30s, that actually that is, might that matter. Exists, and so, yeah. yeah, I think that that's the, my problem. I think, if anything, that suggests that there should be more levels, right? That maybe there's a t- an argument for a top 10 or a top yeah. 7, and then there's, you know, 7 to 20, and then there's the rest of tier 1 or yeah. something like that. I guess the only other story coming out of the rankings that's of note is that we we already talked about how they were going to include some discussion of debt load that the Mm -hmm. students have on the back end. And that resulted in a bump up of one school that was already in the top. But for those of you who have been following the Above the Law Power 50 for top law schools for a while, you know that our ranking system, which already cared about how expensive law schools (laughs) were, and the US News has finally several years later caught up. So good for them. But there actually was a similar bump. And if you've followed us for years, you know that our ranking system loves Penn. Mm-hmm. For whatever, you know, like when you take into account expense, Penn gets an unnatural bump, or not unnatural, but gets a natural bump, actually, in our system. And with debt load finally having some impact on U.S. news, Penn also popped up and is now, it's uh, CCNP, basically, based on this year, uh, when you count that debt issue. Sure. I mean, I think I think a few things. I think, first of all, I'm not sure that debt is debt is not expense, right? Uh, of course. And it you don't want to put too much emphasis solely on debt as opposed to cost, because then you have an impetus as a law school to admit people who are able to pay outright mm. for schooling rather than having to take loans for schooling. But I do think that debt is useful to a certain extent. First of all, because it could also incentivize law schools to use some of their endowments to give money to students so that they don't have to take out additional money in debt. So I think that that's true, but I think that it's it's a complicated formula, and I think just including one aspect of sort of the colloquial cost is – we have to watch out to see what it kind of does long term as they're now including it. But the other story is what they decided – not to include, right? Uh-huh. Uh, at, at the last second, they talked about and touted their diversity ratings and then at the last second pulled them. Yeah. So now why did that happen? Um, I believe the story is that uh, there was a lot of uh, concern from law schools that um, not everybody was counted uh, yeah. in, in, in how they decided to, in their initial version to count diversity, particularly folks that are multiracial. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, you know, people who had more than one box to check uh, weren't weren't necessarily being counted. Mm-hmm. And so they decided to, to kind of hold off on it. But I think the fact that they, they pulled it, I think, less than a week from their release oh, yeah. date, right? Uh, that is very concerning just in terms of how did it get 
that far in the process without realizing that they were potentially excluding tons of people. And they went super far in the process. And it wasn't until massive, you know, kind of concern from law school deans that it was finally pulled. And it just it's it's worrying. It was a bad look to be changing your rankings multiple times in the last week before going public. It's really absurd. Like, I mean, we kind of have a, a weird relationship to that to the sense that we, as you mentioned, we have our power 50 and, you know, above the law is evolved in, in other rankings. And we kind of, not that we do it because we're not the quants here, but we kind of see that it what happens kind of behind the scenes. And the notion that less than a week from pub date, you're mm-hmm. changing stuff is uh, yeah, very, not- very, it's, it's, it's definitely eyebrow raising, jaw dropping, whatever other yeah. kind of facial tics you want to talk about that denote surprise and shock yeah well it it is interesting and um but i but here's the other i think it is and i think it's terrible but i'm not sure that it's going to really displace u.s news as like kind of the ultimate yeah no i i think that's fair ultimate list maker they're a great list making company yeah and i mean that's basically all they do yeah the u.s news and world rankings (laughs) uh but you know hey it's uh it's out there uh, yeah, and debt load, I, I, I hear your point about like mm-hmm. what you take on, like because if you're working as a public defender, your debt load's going to be higher than if you go out and become like a transactional attorney at a big law firm. And you know, how have those law firms weathered previous economic downturns and come out stronger on the other side? LexisNexis Interaction has released an in-depth global research report confronting the 2020 downturn, lessons learned during previous economic crises. Download your free copy at interaction.com slash like a lawyer to see tips, strategies, plans, and statistics from leaders who have been through this before and how they've reached success again. Well, again, speaking of a transition on the back end. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, we're going to do it again. We kind of started the, this conversation by talking about vaccines, and we're really getting close to the post, you know? the Yeah, that's the term you choose to use for uh, things, yeah? A prey? I don't care. <laughs> the apre. Yeah, oh, yeah, a that's prey. more that's a more uh, that's more cultural. Yeah, let's uh... apre COVID. And one of the things that I know at Above the Law we've been talking about a lot is what the offices and office life will look like in the after. And I, I think it's it's really interesting. I think that even well before COVID, office space was, I know, a particular pet project of yours. So yeah. You've gone on a couple of. Uh, of office tours, when, which I love. Yeah, one of my favorite. One of my I've favorite one, things yeah. was office tours. Yeah, yeah. they're great. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's fun to see how innovative firms can be, or how distinctly not innovative law firms can be. But now we're at the point where we have to make decisions. Yeah. Commercial real estate is really going through a hit. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know that Cushman and Wakefield does these studies and they find that already commercial real estate's off about 20%, uh, just as people aren't getting the same square footage they used to because they're starting to, those who are coming up on renewing leases are looking at the situation and saying, look, we built this infrastructure Mm -hmm. to work from home and it has been very successful. So why do I need to spend hundreds per square foot, which you do in New York, Mm -hmm. on a place for everyone to sit when they aren't going to be there all the time or don't have to be? And some firms had already started this. When I did my tour of Errant Fox, they actually were very upfront that they were minimizing the sizes of associate office and partner offices because they were already, this was several years ago, Mm -hmm. already seeing a drive towards more telecommuting. And they were recognizing, look, we don't need this space. We need people to have a space to drop their stuff, but a lot of times they're not going to be there. And when I did my tour of the new Boyce Schiller facility, they also had mm-hmm. moved associates, and some grumbled about this, <laughs> but they'd moved a lot of the associates to basically bullpens, but used most of their space for conference rooms of all sorts of sizes, large ones, tiny ones, little ones that you could hop in if you just were in for the day and needed a phone and a place to dock your computer. But they had tons of different common spaces for you to jump into to work out of rather than large dedicated spaces to you. And I think ultimately, I think that kind of model between what Boys and what Aaron Fox had done is going to be the way in a lot of firms look at this going forward. If they're coming up on it, Why do you necessarily Mm -hmm. build a giant space with tons of 
dedicated homes for people when you know that uh, a lot of people can work from home. Yeah, and, and this is very much a forward-looking potential economic impact mm-hmm. of COVID, right? Because as you said, folks who currently have leases that are up or about to be up are thinking about this right yeah. now, but lo- lo- leases are long-term, right? Yeah. <laughs> leases are going to be very, very long-term in the commercial space and in New York. And so it's something that's going to continue to happen this year, next year, five, six, seven, ten years from now. We're still going to be kind of feeling the ramifications of of yes, we have you know done more for working from home. We only expect people to be in the office a minimum. You know, we two you have to be here at least two days a week. Well, now that that's the next thing, and we've already heard of uh, rumblings from a couple of big firms right. that they're considering the future of the five day work week. Um, obviously, <laughs> that's it's still a seven day work. Well, week. I was going to say it's that law. sounds like you really have to work seven, right? It, you, but you're all, but but that's what you have to do anyway. It, it's already a seven day work week. The question of whether or not five of it has to be in the office, or we right. recognize that given that it's a seven day work week in reality in big law, maybe you do only commit to being in three to four, right? And they're still discussing. Obviously, that is very different than committing. But the idea that firms have openly told their associates they're thinking about it suggests to me there's momentum. Right. And that's also part of what the other kind of COVID related thing that's happening is a hot lateral market, um, Mm -hmm. you know, particularly for associates in the corporate space, which, you know, we've heard rumors of, you know, six figure signing bonuses for associates, not partners, associates, (laughs) which is, which is I, and I, I can confirm that based on the, the work that I do as a consultant with, yeah. in that space. Yeah. yeah. So the, we're talking very – and one of the kind of carrots that firms are holding out are either we're not going to make you commit to a five days work week yeah. in the office anytime soon – which is kind of the the you know the softer version, and then there's other firms that are saying we are going to hire remote only associates. Yeah, you know we want to open up the entire country or the entire world and say you know wherever we find the best candidates, we're going to get them, and we're not going to tell you you have to move to New York or DC or wherever. Yeah. And that's very appealing to a lot of folks who've gotten used to it. Yeah. Well, one point that I had never thought of before. But I had a conversation with somebody uh, just the other day that it got me to thinking one one aspect of the moving towards more remote working mm-hmm. can bring is it can normalize accommodations and situations of, uh, that working mothers already yeah. face. That even though there have been setups where people can work from home in that sort of situation already, before now, there's a subtle or not or, subtle. or potentially not so subtle, but <laughs> not it, subtle. It, it, in its best world, subtle marginalization that happens. Oh, they're the one who doesn't work here on Fridays, or they're the one right. who gets whatever. Right. Oh, and, I know you don't work here on right. Fridays. Right. But, but like normalizing that with a lot of people having work from home on a more routine basis mm-hmm. can help bring that and make it seem more, you know, right. I, I already said the word normalized, but yeah. yeah. It's like every parent this past year has had to deal with working from home and balancing life. And sure, women have, studies have suggested, have taken on the brunt of those mm-hmm. responsibilities during the pandemic, but it, it's something that more people across the board have become aware of. And folks without kids are, are much more aware of it too, because you know when you're having a Zoom and you can hear children crying yeah. in the background, you're like, oh, that must suck for you. <laughs> you, you know. But, but there is a greater awareness of the way in which childcare plays a role in equity in the workspace. Mm-hmm. And I think that hopefully we can use that momentum to make some changes. Yeah. Well, in any event, I think we're done here. So yeah. So <laughs> thanks, of course, to <laughs> Lexus <ended>, yeah. <laughs> Nota, powered by m t Bank and LexisNexis Interaction. You should be subscribed to the show so that you get new episodes when they drop. You should be giving our podcast some reviews on whatever podcast service you utilize. Stars, write something that engages the algorithm, shows that people care, and that helps it be suggested to more people who might be interested in hearing our Weekly, mus- tones. weekly musings <laughs> on the legal world, yes. Uh, you should be reading above the law, obviously. Follow us on social media. We, I'm at Joseph Patrice. She's at Catherine One. The numeral one is the case may be. You should listen to The Jabot, which is her podcast about diversity in law and law school. You can check me out also at the weekly Legal Tech Trending News Clubhouse on Wednesdays at, I think, 1230. I think I, that, that one I can't be... It's 12 or 12.30, but it it's based out of England, so I don't actually know based on when they choose to do daylight saving time what time it is. So that one I can't, I can't say. But also the uh, Legal Tech Weekly Journalist Roundtable uh, is also a show to check out. New episodes of that I know have been uploaded recently because I got 
because I do subscribe and I got my notification that they just came out. Yeah. And with all of that said, I think we're done. You, uh... Peace. Check us out later. Bye. Bye.